About two years ago, a young man here in middle school in, in Utica uh, made this comment. It was, a, it was a passing comment. It wasn't part of a discussion. But what he said was, I don't like Christians because Christians hate gays. I was in the principal's, not office, but a conference room with him, and I had limitations on the kind of discussions I could have, as you would understand, in a public school. And I just simply said, well, I'm a Christian and I don't hate gays. And that was literally the extent of that discussion. Uh, for some reason, that young man liked me and liked meeting with me, even though he knew I was a Christian. And in his mind, in his mind, all Christians hate gays. Unfortunately, that young man is right in some limited perspectives. Uh, obviously, his portrayal, what's been portrayed to him uh, by the media or in other ways, or maybe by Christians, them, some Christians themselves, I don't want to overgeneralize, is a hatred for anybody who's gay or bisexual or transsexual. Or uh, I found out this week that there's at least 63 gender classifications. 63 that I thought, wow, ooh. I, 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 you know, I grew up thinking there were two. Anyway, um, I can understand. I can understand his perspective, even though I, I think it's um, wrong and right. While in college, I had three good friends that I found out sooner or later uh, were either had homosexual encounters earlier in life or were gay. Two of them were roommates. Two of them were my very first roommates that I had as I entered college. Of course, that's not a label they wore or a pronouncement that they made. I found that out later on in life. One of them was just a one-year roommate, and he dropped out after his first year of college. Uh, the other one has uh, been married now. He and his wife together have a, an adult son. They've been married for almost as long as Terry and I have, uh, 40 years. Um, one of them, the one that dropped out, gave me my very first study Bible. He and a friend of his gave me a Thompson Chain Reference Study Bible. He was very active in church, and in fact, they all were. One of them was the pianist at the ch local church that I attended and where I was ordained uh, a little bit after that. And um, he went to the same seminary that I did a little bit after I did. He married his childhood sweetheart. And then while in seminary, came out as gay. And then that led to a divorce from his wife. Um, I say all that to say that this subject is a very personal subject. We all know somebody, or we know somebody who knows somebody who is homosexual or gay, lesbian. A lot of terms. We all know somebody. Perhaps there are somebody listening uh, over the internet or uh, here this morning who has wondered and struggled. And in most church settings, nobody admits to the feelings. I wonder if, I wonder if I'm straight or gay. Um, today and this week, I'm going to attempt to do the impossible. And I know the subject matter itself uh, is conflictual and contradictory. Um, this would be a, a, a subject matter I thought I could get. So it's going to take at least two weeks, uh, hopefully only two weeks. This would be a topic that would be honestly easier to avoid than to speak about publicly. And I felt compelled because I feel like it has the potential. What I'm going to share has the potential of helping people. And that's why I feel like uh, I, I felt so compelled uh, to do this. Now, somebody <clears throat> may be tempted to argue with me about some of the things I might say. And I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, I will not engage in an argument. Go. It's 
one of the most embarrassing moments of my life because it was in front of my entire, not just family that you know, but sisters, brother, nephews, nieces. And it was like, oh, wow, I, it's not one of my finer moments in life. So I will not engage in an argument. I will, however, be glad to disengage with anybody in an open, honest discussion. And I hope you will grant me this special favor. Whoever, whoever listens to this, please listen to everything I'm going to say. Please do not be guilty of taking anything that I'm going to say out of context and getting a sound bite or a Twitter bite, or a social media post, and make me say thereby something that is not what I really said or intended to say. So I'm going to ask for that favor, and um, I'll just leave it at that because I can't control what anybody does. So what I hope to be able to do this week and next is to answer basically two questions and draw an important, some important applications for us. So I've entitled this message, Homosexuality, the Bible, and the Church. And there's probably not a more controversial subject in our country than that. So, so what I'm going to attempt to do is this, and this is where I'm going to focus today. What does current research say on this subject? What does current research say on that subject? You've heard it said, born that way. Is it genetic? Is it a choice? Number two, what does the Bible say? You've heard people say what they say the Bible says, but I would ask you, have you ever personally researched either the research that's out there or what the Bible says or are you guilty of taking somebody else's word for it? And I'm getting an echo in what I'm saying. You guys hear that too? Like you get to hear it twice? It's coming at us somewhere. Maybe it's coming, I don't know. If you don't hear it, I'm not worried about it. So, but I'm definitely hearing myself twice. So what does the Bible say on the subject? And then thirdly, what should be the church of Jesus Christ? What should be the church's Response. It's one of the reasons why I preached the message that I did last week, and I apologize because for whatever reason, uh, our Facebook feed was horrible sound. And even in running it through iMovie and GarageBand and trying to correct the sound and getting it good so that I could post a video, was just not successful at that. And I wanted that message to be online because it's a good precursor to everything that I want to say today. So that message was about truth and grace. So my apologize to anyone who tried to listen last week. I, we found out later it was horrible, and uh, there's nothing that we could do about it um, in, in, in hindsight. So, um, but that message was about the truth about truth and grace. The truth about truth and grace. And I just want to reference that. That's John chapter 8 as a good working uh, basis for this. So one of the reasons we're, I'm doing this is because we're inching our way through a passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 6 that's just commonly given the title, uh, The Armor of God. And there's some preliminary remarks that Paul talks about that we have. We're involved in the spiritual warfare, and there's principalities and powers and all that. And then we get to uh, the verse that says, put on the belt of truth, the belt of truth. And so ultimately, that's what has got me to this subject, because what is the truth about this subject? I mentioned last week that Jesus made a claim in John 18, 37, that he came to bear witness to the truth. And he said that anyone who listens to the truth or is on the side of truth listens to him. It's quite a claim when you think about it. <laughs> If you disagree, Jesus is saying, if you disagree with me, you're not on the side of truth. No, he's not saying that if you disagree with Jeff Houghton. He's saying if you disagree with him, you know, then you're not on the side of truth. That's quite a claim. Quite a claim. I mean, it's either true, the claim, or it's not. And then there's a lot of claims to truth. Uh, we went through that last week as well. And I'm not going to go back to that, but it's a truth claim. We all make claims to truth. Ever have an argument with your spouse 
and you claim that you didn't say or did say and she or he said no you didn't or yes you did you're both making truth claims right and obviously they both can't be true when they are contradictory to each other and so there's a lot of truth claims out there and Jesus made some very powerful uh, truth claims so what does science say what does science say and I want to say that I attempted to approach this subject matter in the same way that I had to do in writing research papers when I was working on a master's degree. We had to go to the professional journal articles, like no, Wikipedia. Uh, in fact, I graduated in 96. I don't, well, there was an internet. Yes, there was. But I had to go to the like Denison University Library or OSU COTC Library and go to what they call the stacks you know, where they keep all the resource uh, material um, on the shelves and, 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 and search them out. Now, all that information is available on the Internet. Now, I know not everything you read on the Internet is true, but when you go to legitimate journal articles that are well-respected and they're published on the Internet, then, then you pretty much can know um, that this is a legitimate, not just somebody's opinion. There is research. So there is research that is being done on this subject matter. So let me take you back uh, about 30 years. In 1991, there was a guy by the name of Simon LeVay. So Simon LeVay. He did some research, basically, uh, and there's the, it was published in the science at that, on that website. You can look that up. That's why I put that out there. I don't have any other notes for you today. But if you're interested, you want to take a screenshot, you want to look this up later, hopefully it all, you know, at least the, the pictures will be on our Facebook live feed. And you, you can look it up yourself. You can look it up yourself. But he did some studies on uh, cadavers of men uh, that had died of HIV. Now he assumed, this is part of the criticism that others have made about his research, he assumed that everyone in that period of time that died of HIV as a male was gay because you couldn't question them as to whether they were gay or not for obvious reasons. But he made that assumption and he found, <laughs> this is, I'm going to read this because it's technical, uh, he compared uh, the size of the interstitial nucleus of the anterior hypothalamus, which has been labeled the INAH3, and a group of gay men to a group of straight men and women. And he reported that some of the gay men, some, not all, had larger INAH3 structures, and some of the straight men had smaller INAH3 structures. I'll just give you a brief synopsis. That study, the, the study results were featured then on PBS, Newsweek, Nightline, the Phil Donahue show. Some of you remember the Phil Donahue show? You know, like, yeah, and the Oprah Winfrey show. So uh, those study results were then featured in those outlets and perhaps some others. And LeVay himself cautioned against misinterpreting his findings. And this is a quote. I did not prove that homosexuality is genetic or find a genetic cause for being gay. I didn't show that gay men are born that way. The most common mistake people make in interpreting my work, nor did I locate a gay center in the brain. But because of publicity, media, immediately it was out there. This phrase was coined later, and I'll share that with you. Born that way. Born that way. LeVay also stated that since he only studied the brain structures of adults, he could make no claims as to what led to these findings. Some scientists have pointed out some difficulties with his study. Anne Fosto Sterling at Brown University said this, LeVay's data showed a range of size values for INAH3 in both the homosexual and heterosexual brains. Some of the gay men had larger INAH3 structures, some of the straight men had smaller structures, and the numbers overlapped. If LeVay picked a nucleus size somewhere in the middle of the samples, he couldn't tell if it was heterosexual or homosexual. So a researcher from Brown University, a respected university, 
uh, brought some criticism, critique of his research. Fast forward 200, uh, 200 two years, uh, 1993, Dean Hammer et al. I had to look up what et al. means. It means and others. So Dean Hammer and others, he was the primary uh, one of the published research at least. In 1993, uh, there was an article published with the title, A Linkage Between DNA Markers on the X Chromosome and Male Sexual Orientation. Their research uh, received attention from the mass media. In 1993, USA Today and Time reported that Hammer and his team demonstrated strong evidence to support X-linked inheritance of homosexuality and that there existed a genetic com component to sexual orientation. And again, it's picked up the national media and the term was not coined yet. That comes a little bit later, uh, born that way. However, 1995, Scientific American published an article about scientific doubts about the genetic influence of homosexuality. A later study duplicated Hammer's study and found no X-linked gene that contributed to male sexual orientation. The researchers of that study agreed with the possibility that homosexuality is genetically inherited, but they found no evidence to justify the claims that Hammer and his team had made that homosexuality was maternally inherited and that the gene XQ28, that's why I'm sticking close to my notes this morning, folks, um, because this is, you know, I don't have all this memorized. So after the 1990s, Scientists have sometimes questioned that homosexuality is genetically determined and have looked at environmental behavioral factors instead. You can look that up. One of the common research things that is, it relates to identical twin studies. Since they both share the same DNA, then the uh, amount, degree of homosexuality between identical twins should be 100% if it's genetically caused. And so the, home, the, the, the occurrence of homosexuality in, in, in a pair of identical twins uh, has been found uh, to be uh, Eleven percent for men and fourteen percent for women. A significant twin study among adolescents shows an even weaker correlation. In 2002, Behrman and Bruckner studied tens of thousands of adolescent students in the U.S. The same-sex attraction concordance between identical twins was only 7.7 percent for males and 5.3 percent for females lower than the 11 and 14 in the Australian study done by Bailey et al. that I referenced a few moments ago. But identical twin studies is often stated as evidence for genetically inheriting homosexuality and thus being born that way. Um, I found this from a researcher um, from Columbia University, and I had to add it later in my notes because I found it later after I had um, had things prepared. It's my appendix, and I'm looking for my appendix of my notes, and uh, forgive me, I'm a little bit, like I said, tied. Okay, so this, this comes from researcher at Columbia University. Um, I've already referenced them, Peter Behrman and Hannah Bruckner. The authors consider social genetic, this is a, a synapse, synapse summary of their uh, research. So the authors considered the social genetic evolutionary and hormonal transfer hypothesis for same-sex romantic prefer preferences of adolescence. 
uh, the, the subject sample was 5,552 5, sibling pairs drawn from a nationally representative sample. They show that the pattern of concordance of same-sex preference among siblings is inconsistent with a simple genetic influence model. Their results provide sub substantial support for the role of social influences, reject the hormone transfer model, reject a speculative evolutionary theory, and are consistent with a general model that allows for genetic expression of same-sex attraction under specific highly circumscribed social conditions. Again, you can look that up. Neil Whitehead is a researcher has written extensively on this subject in a book called My Genes Made Me Do It, uh, published in 2016, reviewed more than 10,000 scientific papers and publica publications on homosexuality. And this is what he found. Homosexuality is overwhelming, overwhelmingly environmental. Any biological contribution to homosexuality is weak and indirect. Of course, homosexuality is partly genetic, but so is throwing a baseball, because without genes, we cannot act in the environment. The genetic component in throwing a baseball doesn't mean that we are compelled to throw the baseball. In other words, nothing about our genes or biological makeup compels homosexuality. The homosexual orientation is not biologically innate or fixed. There are many former homosexuals around, according to his research. He goes on to say about 3% of the present heterosexual population once firmly believed themselves to be homosexual or bisexual. The number of people who have changed towards exclusive heterosexuality is greater, I mean, these are people that were in homosexuality, the gay, lesbian lifestyle, the number of people who have changed towards exclusive heterosexuality is greater than current numbers of bisexuals and homosexuals combined. In other words, ex-gays outnumber actual gays according to the research done by Neil Whitehead. And according to his research, most of that happens almost quite naturally without what sometimes is referred to as conversion therapy. Conversion therapy is a controversial study, uh, subject matter in and of itself. There are those who say there should not be any conversion. So in other words, if a homosexual wants to stop being homosexual, there should be no self-respecting therapist, psychologist, counselor that would offer them conversion therapy to revert or, or come to heterosexuality. And the reasoning behind that is because it's inborn. Born that way. But there's a large number of former homosexuals, le lesbians, that, according to Neil Whitehead, they outnumber the number of actual gays, uh, according to his research. Michelle Wirth from Notre Dame on the concept of nature versus nurture, genetics or environment. Almost all of our behavior and traits are a product of both nature and nurture. The nature and nurture debate actually does not make much sense because genes and environment have a constant interplay throughout the lifespan. However, whether through genes or learning, there is no doubt that sexual orientation is manifested somehow in our brains. This is because the brain is responsible for all of our thoughts, behaviors, personality, characteristics, everything that we are. The brain is not a fixed entity. I'm going to pause there for a moment. Uh, my wife has homeschooled our kids, and sometimes they would ask the question, why do we have to learn this? And her answer was, because it's, uh, it's forming neural pathways in your brain <laughs> that you will use later in life. So the brain is not a fixed entity. Learning changes your brain every day, whether very fleeting changes like a phone number you forget immediately or a long-lasting behavior patterns like being shy or outgoing and perhaps like sexual orientation. The brain can change. 
So far, scientists think that, like most human behavior, sexual attraction is the result of a complex orchestration between genes, early hormone exposures, and other environmental factors. There is probably no one thing that determines sexual orientation, but each clue gives us a little more information about human sexuality and how we come to be who we are. Interesting. You guys find this interesting as I do? I mean, I, I maybe, maybe not. Good thing I got my pages numbered. Now this is related, but not connected, and it kind of comes on the tail end of what I just shared. Behavioral. Um, this comes from Harvard University. Now listen to this. This, this, is, this is fascinating. A lot of studies that are done on the brain and, and what, what affects not just how the brain works, but the actual structure of the brain. Actual structure. And for example, it's been proven and shown through, and this is easier to study because you don't have to have a cadaver through MRIs and CT scans. Childhood a trauma, for, for example, affects three areas of our brain in terms of its actual structure. The amyg amygdala, the hippocampus, and the medial prefrontal cortex. By the way, pop quiz at the end of my... This is more like a lecture, isn't it? It's more like, you know, anyway, just sharing with you some things that I think, and I'll get to the reasons why, uh, that, that are vitally important especially for anybody who's in a public school, anybody who's going to be going to college, uh, even sadly, in my opinion, some of our Christian schools. Um, I think people need to be armed with viable research findings. So it, it actually affects the structure and... Uh, this researcher from Harvard says, fortunately, these changers, changes can be reversed over time. So yes, childhood trauma does affect the actual structure of the brain, but over time, the structure can go back to a, what you might consider a more normal. I, I found this interesting. This is something my wife is extremely fascinated about and integrates into her style of teaching. But the study of the integration of art in ch early childhood education has shown that the brain stem is thicker in children who are exposed to art as a part of their educational curriculum. And I, I just share that with you to say that environment, learning experiences, does affect the structure of our brain in various ways. So, how did we get the term born that way? Lady Gaga. Heard of her? Her dogs have been in the news recently. I saw where her bulldogs have been returned to her. Good, good, good for her. Yeah, I, yeah, anyway, I don't know if she paid that $500,000 ransom for them or not, but if she had to to get them back. Anyway, in 2011, released a song entitled Born This Way, which won, by the way, several MTV Music Awards. And here's uh, a few lines from her song. No matter gay, straight, or bi, lesbian, transgendered, life, I'm on the right track, baby. I was born to survive. No matter black, white, or beige, chola, which is Hispanic, or I had to look that up, or Orient made. I'm on the right track, baby. I was born to be brave. I'm beautiful in my way, because God makes no mistakes. I'm on the right track, baby. I was born this way. And that really is where the uh, title or, or the phrase, born that way, really became popular in, in our culture. What I'm trying to do today is to bring a little bit of doubt on the scientific accuracy of that statement because you will need it sooner or later in life. So bottom line, 
the pros and the cons. Research is not conclusive on this. For every pro, hereditary, born that way argument, you can find a con, contrary, or vice versa. In fact, I want to give you a website. It's called Born Gay, uh, Pro Con. You can look that up, and you can read those arguments for yourself. So what I'm simply saying is, is that researchers have not made any conclusive findings on this, but that's not what's reported, and that's not what's stated in the public arena. Is it not? Am I correct in that? So I think there are some implications. Since there is no conclusive proof that people are born that way, to make that claim is the expression of an opinion that has not been scientifically verified. Secondly, people can and do change. People can and do change. Heterosexuals can and do become homosexual, but homosexual movement would say, well, they were always homosexual. They just discovered it or came out. Homosexuals can and do become heterosexual. I referenced Neil Whitehead's research earlier. And there are stories of people who have changed. In fact, this link, thechangedmovement.com, is, uh, I put a link to that on our Faith Outpost Church website for easy reference. You can look it up and you can go to that and what you will find there are numerous stories of former gays and lesbians who have uh, come out of that lifestyle and I simply share that with you as evidence that people change. Of course, people change the other way all the time as well. We know that. So the bottom line implication is this. <laughs> Whether you're heterosexual, homosexual, transsexual, bisexual, agender, that's one of the 63, A meaning no gender at all. You could actually claim that, probably on some form somewhere. Or uh, any of the other 58 possible gender identities, including male, female, uh, no, no matter what, the, here's, here's the bottom line. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only hope for all of us. It's the only hope for all of us. The gospel. The Christ, God became a man, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death, rose a triumphant resurrection, ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, one day returning to make all things new. And that by faith in Him, men and women can be restored to God no matter what our gender identity is. Bottom line is the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only hope for mankind, whether you're male or female, whether you're black or white, whether you're Hispanic, whether you're Asian, whether you're South American, whatever your lifestyle, whatever your origins, whatever your nationality, whatever your former manner of life, whatever your sin may or may not have been, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only hope but it is the hope, it is the power of God unto salvation to anyone who believes in Jesus. There's a power to it that changes our lives. So the gospel is the true hope. God loves all the people of the world, every individual, whether they believe in him or not, whether they believe in other gods or not. Whether they deny him, have walked away from him, drifted away, God loves you. And nothing will ever change that. Not your sexual orientation or your sexual experiences. No matter what sin you may have been involved in or currently involved in, God loves you. And he gave his only begotten son for the salvation of mankind. And that is the only true hope. I listened to one a message that was very encouraging and informative to me. And he, he talked about when he was in college working at a restaurant. 
and uh, a certain individual found out that he was a Christian and suddenly stopped interacting with him. And they had been somewhat friendly in the work environment. And eventually he went to her and said, you know, I noticed you stopped. She goes, yeah, I found out you're a Christian. And Christians believe that homosexuals go to hell. His response to her was a true statement. Hell is populated by people. People do go to hell. But there's a lot of heterosexuals in hell. There's a lot of people from every nationality, nation, tongue in hell. But the only hope is Jesus Christ. The only hope of the world for you and me is Jesus Christ. So God loves all the people of the world, every individual in it so much that he sacrificed his only begotten son that we would not have to perish and so that we could have everlasting life. So next week, I'm going to attempt to answer this question. What does the Bible really say? And what are the implications for the church? So I hope you'll uh, stay tuned and I hope you won't misquote me, take anything that I've said out of context, and uh, stay tuned. I hope I've piqued your interest enough. And like I said, one of the reasons I felt compelled to share about this is because, number one, I'm a seeker of truth. Number two, um, there's a lot of misinformation that can be scientifically verify, verifiably brought into question. Would you pray with me?